Well, the war in Ukraine has been going on for a couple of months now, and it has, of course, been at the receiving end of a lot of attention as well, both from the traditional media and here on YouTube, on social media, on the internet as a whole. After also making quite a few videos about what was going on in Ukraine regarding the air domain, I essentially held off for some time of treating the subject. But I thought, you know, now is the time, perhaps, after a couple of months have passed, to really reassess what is going on in Ukraine, what the air situation is, because we seem to have gone through a couple of phases there, and crucially also what lessons should be drawn from the conflict in terms of the air operations that NATO countries can do. And to talk about this subject, I've invited Justin Bronk. He's a senior research fellow at the Royal United Services Institute. He's of course been on the channel before, last year specifically with an interview on the Russian Air Force as well as on the Chinese Air Force. And I sat down with him to talk a little bit more about what is currently going on over in Ukraine and exactly what those lessons are that we should draw from it. So Justin, if we if we go look back to sort of February and March 2022, a lot of us were quite surprised to sort of see the poor performance of the Russian armed forces, specifically also uh, the VKS, so the aerospace forces. Put us all on the same page now. Just could you just give us a, a brief account of sort of VKS air activity uh, in or inactivity actually uh, in those uh, first couple of weeks? Yeah. So in the in the first couple of weeks, uh, the the bulk of the VKS. Uh, tactical fighter force, or so fighters, fighter bombers, essentially seemed to stay on the ground. There was really very limited air activity in terms of fixed wing combat aircraft beyond uh, large numbers of sorties by strategic bombers to launch standoff cruise missile strikes as part of those barrages. They launched around 650 uh, cruise and ballistic missiles in the initial uh, salvos, targeting a mix of Ukrainian early warning radars, uh, some air base attacks, and they didn't generally managed to crater the runways particularly well. They hit uh, a few concentrations of, of derelict aircraft on hard stands. Um, but generally speaking, a lot of the craters, if you look for, look for them, they were actually sort of near the taxiways, but not on them. And so the Ukrainian Air Force was, was able to fly um, multiple sorties even on the fir- in the first few hours. However, the, the sort of bit that we now know a bit more about than we did back then, um, from an outside perspective, is that the Russian initial Russian electronic warfare was extremely successful at suppressing the Ukrainian uh, ground-based air defense uh, network. So not only did those those early cruise missile, the ballistic missile salvos, effectively hit quite a few of Ukraine's uh, S-300, uh, PS, PT uh, batteries, so the truck or trailer mounted ones that had very, very limited mobility because they had uh, almost no spare parts. Um, and so we're in, in a bad state of repair. Those were hit um, badly, but also uh, the mobile SAMs that were present, particularly north of Kyiv, uh, were effectively suppressed by Russian electronic warfare capabilities. And so, uh, the, for example, the, the ill-fated and now famous helicopter insertion to Hostomel uh, airfield to the northwest of Kyiv, um, that actually got in with no problems. That they didn't lose any helicopters on the way in um, because the Ukrainian air, air defences were, were very well uh, suppressed electronically. As the ground forces started to move in um, down the roads and their, their communication problems started to mount up, uh, and the Ukrainians started moving their, their uh, air defence assets around as best they could, Russia lost the ability quite quickly to maintain the alignment and the, the capability to keep jamming like that. So uh, the Ukrainian air defences sort of woke up uh, after um, the first sort of opening uh, hours when they were when they had been suppressed. The sort of biggest surprise, I think, um, for you know folks who've been uh, like myself been looking at the Russian air force for a long time was the inactivity of the, the, the fixed wing fast jet fleet. Normally you would expect uh, in a Western run air campaign, at least, or an American run air campaign to be specific, that that barrage of long range cruise missiles uh, would that, that take, you know, blinding early warning radars, cratering taxiways, hitting uh, long range surface to missiles, that sort of thing, um, would then be followed up with large scale raids by um, multi-role combat aircraft, particularly strike aircraft, so that the rest of the defenses have to try and engage them because otherwise those strike aircraft will get through to their targets and smash up everything that's that's currently blinded or, or struggling to take off. And then you'd, you'd have that accompanied by, you know, suppression of enemy air defenses and destruction of enemy air defenses. Nation hugely effective. It's become the kind of accepted Western recipe for obtaining air superiority quickly. And the Russians just didn't do it. Now appears that they, they can't do that and we can go into why. Mm. Um, but that's certainly what folks like me expected to see. Um, 
And if you know, unfortunately, you can check my homework because I did uh, publish a piece in early February, uh, so before the invasion, saying you know, entitled Ukrainian options in the uh, air defense options in the event of a Russian attack. Um, and basically saying, you know, they'll, they'll rapidly be destroyed if they attempt to oppose directly. And therefore, they'll have to do this defense in depth, you know, threat in being, trying to be pop up threats and all the rest, which is not entirely wrong. But um, it's, uh, we basically gave the Russian Air Force far more credit in terms of uh, than, it, than it, it turned out to, to deserve in terms of its ability to generate, uh, integrate, and command a complex strike package like that. Picking up on that, it's just. This- Obviously, we're not able to ex- inspect Russian airfields and, and what exactly is going on, on on their side of things. But given of what we're seeing, what appears to actually be the, the main problems in the VKS of putting out those those fixed wing uh, sorties and, and striking those targets? So initially, in the first few weeks, uh, certainly the first week, uh, when you really saw very limited activity, uh, I think it's, it appears to be that the, the tactical um, fighter units were basically given almost no warning uh, that Actual, the actual invasion was going to happen because uh, thanks to the, it must be said, extremely impressive. And I think in, in, in retrospect, we're going to look back and see it as actually critical. Um, but decision by the Biden administration and the Johnson government uh, in the UK and the US to publish incredibly high level intelligence uh, in terms of essentially Russian general staff level intelligence leaks. So just, you know, briefing for weeks beforehand, saying that the decision has been taken to invade. This is the next, you know, um, uh, provocation that they're planning in the DNR and LNR. And and the fact that the Russians just kind of had no choice but to keep trying to do them anyway, just follow the playbook, even though it was being exposed, appears in retrospect now to have been incredibly important because it convinced the the, the Kremlin, the leadership in the Kremlin, uh, so Putin and his sort of close security um, oligarch circle, um, that they, the, the Russian military was penetrated at the highest levels. The result of that seems to have been that they basically kept the plan from the military until the very last minute. Uh, it appears that sort of major and lieutenant colonel, so, you know, large formation commanders got about 24 hours notice um, that they were going to move to serious combat operations, which is you know, insanely inadequate for the amount of planning you would have to do. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've used this comparison before, but in a major NATO, NATO exercise with multi, you know, multinational components, you would expect about 24 hours to be needed to just sync up all the different encryption and all the different radio sets. Um, you know, much less plan the whole operation and the logistics and the support and everything to go with it. And it appears that the Russian fighter units had much the same problem that they weren't told strategic aviation was ready as we as we said you know with those those uh, long-range bombers with the the salvos of standoff cruise missiles but that would also fit with the same picture in the sense that those are strategic assets that are held and commanded at a much higher echelon um, in terms of within the russian security system so yeah a they they probably weren't ready you know even if you look at you know cases where pretty high readiness western forces have been suddenly told to you know, go and do something like Libya in 2011. You know, it was a couple of weeks to, to spin up the the, four, the, the, the 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 squadrons in question. You know, you, you can fly out in a couple of days. Um, you, generally, it's R2, so two days readiness to move. Um, you know, again, even two days, that's still a few days. But in terms of, you know, that's just getting a couple of aircraft out there. Um, in terms of spinning up a whole squadron or a whole organization, it takes a bit longer, even when those formations are held at high readiness, which the Russians ones, ones weren't really. And then it's worth remembering as well that in terms of the context of the whole first week, that the um, the Russian plan clearly assumed and relied on there being very very limited Ukrainian resistance. In that context, the, they probably thought that assumed that the massive barrage of, of cruise missiles and things would be enough. Right, and, and sort of looking at the last couple of uh, weeks and months, then we. We've seen that drop in VKS activity, especially fixed wing, or at least it doesn't. We don't see that much evidence of it. There is still a lot of uh, rotary wing activity. I think we've all seen sort of the, the uh, the videos of you know the the helicopters sort of um, climbing up and shooting rockets in a general location. But since this has dropped, uh, you know the air activity over Ukraine, uh, both from the VKS, but we're also not seeing that much from the Ukrainian air force. Is this campaign now one there where air activity doesn't really factor in as much? So it's a slightly complicated picture in that sense, in that I certainly characterize the the war as a whole um, as one where air power really plays a pretty subordinate role. Um, it, it's, it's not being used for decisive effect by either side. 
And it's certainly not the decisive shaping influence that we would kind of expect it to be. On the other hand, the, the Russian use of cruise and ballistic missiles, so standoff attacks, which isn't, they're not technically airstrikes, but you know, the, the continued heavy use of standoff attacks has more or less crippled a lot of Ukrainian industry. It uh, continues to allow the Russians to punish concentrations of Ukrainian logistics or, or you know, concentrations of forces at various railheads or whatever. Um, and also, almost more to the point, it, it is crippling the Ukrainian economy in conjunction with the, the fact that the area the Russian forces have taken in the east and the south contains a lot of Ukraine's heavy industry. Mm. But also, of course, they've got the stranglehold on the Black Sea, both through capturing most of the south uh, eastern uh, coastline, or all of the southeastern coastline, but also, of course, blockading Odessa in the southwest. Coupled with that sort of strangulation of the Ukrainian economy, the continued relatively lightweight but continued bombardment of all of the western cities in Ukraine with cruise missiles and ballistic missiles just keeps up that pressure to, to deter Western companies or any, any companies really from investing in Ukraine. So what we've seen is a, is a collapse of foreign investment into Ukraine beyond direct aid. Long term, that has significance. In the shorter term, cruise missiles, obviously, are pretty difficult to use against dynamic targets. Um, they're generally only really useful against fixed targets. The Russians have shown an ability to use Iskander, their ballistic missile, uh, Iskander-M, against uh, battlefield targets on occasion. So they hit an SA-11 as uh, so a book. It's so a single vehicle in field. They found it with, a, with an Orlan 10 uh, UAV and they hit it with a ballistic missile absolutely smack on. Um, so not, not even a cluster warhead, but a unitary warhead and they hit it bang off with you know pretty short response time. We we're talking you know single digits of minutes, hmm. um, which is more than we credited them with. Um, now they can't do that across the board, but where they have uh, UAVs up, they, they have pretty short kill chain uh, now in the Donbass region. And in that context, air power, just apart from the UAVs, which are critical for spotting and have been critical for the Ukrainians as well, mostly small UAVs for artillery spotting. And, and now a lot of the Russian electronic warfare is making that much more difficult um, in the Donbass. That's kind of the dominant shaping thing now. Um, the Russian Air Force is actually flying significantly more than it looks like mm -hmm. it's flying from the outside. It's partly because the, the fighting has been concentrated around Sverdonets uh, and then Lysychansk uh, for the past three, four weeks. And it's been desperate enough that there really hasn't been a huge amount of footage coming out. So where you do, while you do see footage of both sides aircraft, mostly Russians, um, going to and from the battle area, there's not much evidence in the open source about the actual airstrikes that have been happening in those areas because it's been, so, you know, it's been such a dearth of information. The Russian Air Force is clearly flying large numbers of sorties still. Um, most of them remain fighter patrols. So they, they've attrited that front edge of Ukrainian short range SAMs, uh, particularly SA-8s, pretty effectively with artillery. You know, so again, it's not really seed in the classic sense. Uh, the the anti-radiation missile launches haven't really done very much. But the, the UAV spotting for artillery and then bringing that down quickly have forced the Ukrainians to pull their SAMs back or lose them. Mm -hmm. um, now, that's less of an issue in some ways for things like SA-11 that have a bit more range. But for something like SA-8, which is a, a short-ranged SAM system, that really um, forces them into a very difficult dilemma for how they provide cover for the front line. The Russians have the ability to come in and fly regular sorties, particularly with their Sukhoi-25s and their attack aviation. On the other hand, until recently at least... Uh, they were taking a steady trickle of losses, um, you know, less than you might expect, given how much time they're spending down low uh, in amongst uh, all of that, people shooting at them with, with every gun they have, yeah. but also man pads. But again, it's worth remembering where it was taking place, Sverodonetsk and Lysychansk, where because the Russians had captured the high ground north of Papazna, they had a good view with artillery, in effect, of the, the couple of highways into um, Sverodonetsk. Mm -hmm. And so one of the consequences of that is that supplies of man pads dried up because they were using them on a regular basis and you know they basically required a, a regular supply and they didn't really have it. From a morale point of view, clearly the Ukrainians are very, very um, miserable to be being bombed by forces they don't really have a huge amount of, of answers to. But if you, you know, look at the footage that is out there, it's still unguided weapon drops almost exclusively. There's a few KH-29T um, TV-guided missiles being used by the Sukhoi-34s, that appears to be mostly against buildings. 
Um, so again, you're back to that. They can hit a lot of static targets, but battlefield targets are much more difficult. So it's not hugely effective, a lot of this close air support. But from a morale point of view, you know, clearly the Russians have local air superiority in, in parts of the Donbass. And in the first weeks of the conflict, I think a lot of viewers would be interested in this as well. We saw a lot of footage from UCAFs and UAVs, of course. Um, and there's been a lot of hype surrounding uh, Bayraktar, of course, and then loitering munitions like switchblades. And then it appears at least to suddenly have gone silent on that front, right? Um, the systems obviously have their uses, but I do want to sort of take this opportunity to, to ask you, considering what we're seeing in Ukraine now and considering this, this fit for all solution that sometimes is given for these UCAFs that they, that they sort of are replacing air, air and rotary uh, wing activity, where do they actually make sense and where did they work and where did they not work? I'm, I'm going to do a momentary pedantism thing here and say, I, I violently object to the use of the term UCAV to refer to Bayraktar TB2 or MQ-9 Reaper, or you know, frankly, any remotely piloted UAV that has short range missiles on it. Just because something can be used for combat uh, doesn't put it in that category, at least in traditional design and, and, and classification terms in terms of militaries and major manufacturers outside Bayraktar who want to be known as a UCAV manufacturer. So the U.S. Army and the U.S. Air Force's position for a long time has been, uh, you know, despite being the pioneering, arguably pioneering users of, of MQ-1 uh, Predator and MQ-9 Reaper as a sort of standard arm of, of military power. Um, the Israelis, of course, have been playing around with, with UAVs for, for much longer than anybody else, but um, they see them more as a sort of subsidiary system that fits in to the overall ground, ground force structure. Um, in fact, I had a senior Israeli tell me a few years ago, um, when we were talking about UAVs, said, if you think that the primary use of UAVs is to drop munitions, you don't understand UAVs. Mm. And that's from a force that's been using them as an integrated part of their military since the late 70s. It, UCAVs would traditionally be classed as unmanned aircraft that are designed specifically to be used in state-on-state -state combat. So to be survivable and lethal in highly contested airspace. Uh, and that's just not something you can say about any remotely piloted system. Mm. It's not that remotely piloted systems can't be used in those contexts. It's just that it will be in particular situations and particular contexts, and it's not generally a sustainable thing to do. So the US Air Force, for example, doesn't see MQ-1 or MQ-9 as relevant in a peer conflict at all. It's just not relevant. Um, and, you know, when you look at, for example, the Ukrainians uh, who, who perfectly understand this stuff now, um, you know, recently they were offered MQ-1C um, Grey Eagle, which is a fairly advanced derivative of, of Predator, and they basically said, we don't, we don't really care. Like that, that's not useful for us. It's not survivable. Yeah, it has great sensors, but we'd have to get it close enough that it'd be shot down. So we don't care. The same for TB2. I mean, TB2 has not been effective over the battlefield following about the first month of the war. Um, now, the Ukrainians have found plenty of other interesting uses for it, but basically they're not particularly usable over the front lines once the Russians had sorted out their, uh, particularly their air defense coordinations. You know, the Barakters had a bit of a field day in the first few weeks because they literally, you know, all of these Russian columns outrunning their own uh, air defense cover. And then the air defenses were being kind of thrown down roads without being connected to the bigger situational awareness picture, uh, without therefore authorization to, to fire most of the time because they can't de-conflict with, with potential Russian sorties and often being caught in traffic jams or in lagers with, with their radars off. Yeah, absolutely. In that context, having a persistent, armed, relatively slow and small, therefore difficult to track reliably UAV is great. But if you look at the numbers of vehicles destroyed, you know, you're, you're talking 100-ish, slightly over 100 counts, about 60 trucks that they hit. And in the comparison of the nearly four and a bit thousand Russian vehicles that have been lost, I mean, it's a drop in the ocean. Once the, the TB2s were no longer really usable in any sustainable basis over the actual frontline contact areas as a battlefield asset, uh, the Ukrainians have been good at finding innovative new uses for them. So they've used them a lot over the Snake Island, where, of course, particularly after the sinking of the Moskva, um, where the TB2 played a role as a standoff ISR and distraction asset. Um, the Russian, when the Russian Navy had to pull back its major surface combatants post sinking of Moskva, um, they, they, there was basically a lot less uh, defense cover over that part. And if you look at where Snake Island is, it's, it's quite far west. It's, mm. it's not an area where, uh, where Russia had unimpeded ability to operate. And in that context, particularly given that the Russians kept putting their air defense pieces right next to large buildings, which you know, you can literally look at in commercial satellite imagery and go, right, okay, so it's next to this building, which means that if you just paint a shadow, 
behind the building to the SAM, that's where it can't see because the radar doesn't go through buildings. So you could send it, for example, a TB2 low, just in line with that, um, in the shadow, pop up and kill it, exactly what they did. Um, and so, you know, it's not to say that TB2s haven't been useful and they've also re repurposed them essentially as one-way munitions. So flying them into uh, into Russian territory to, to basically hit fixed infrastructure, things like gas, oil storage tanks and things, certainly interesting and it's very, very innovative. In that sense, these things can be annoying um, for a nation to deal with, but they're never going to be strategically decisive. They don't they're not a replacement for air power. Running it around a little bit, we, we spoke a lot about Ukraine and Russia, but what do you think should be the main takeaway for NATO uh, regarding the air operations that we've seen in Ukraine? And, and are there any lessons to be drawn from there? The difficulty here is that we can get a picture of, of what the Russians weren't able to do. And that tells us one of the first lessons which NATO really needs to, to, to pick up and run with, particularly everyone who isn't the US, which is you can have a really capable multi-role force on paper. And if you don't fly enough and you don't exercise enough in real life as well as synthetically with all the different joint force components and all the different enablers and different types of assets that would be required to make that work in practice, then your crews won't be able to do it when you ask them to. And therefore, your multi-role capability doesn't actually exist. A, a fighter pilot with 200 hours a year, which is a sort of reasonable amount these days, although in the Cold War would have been seen as quite low, um, you know, would struggle to be competent across multiple mission sets I mean, really competent, ready to go to war, as opposed to I can just about do them with some work up and then a single test point, um, let alone trying to do that at a large scale with the whole force working together and actually everything working. But, you know, the Russian pilots getting maybe 80 hours a year um, in the frontline squadrons, and they don't have decent simulators to fall back on either. Um, and so at least compared to the West. So, you know, it, it's that that first lesson would be look at what they weren't able to do versus what their Air Force should have been capable of on paper. And so, you know, that should be a really sobering lesson for a lot of NATO Air Forces who have tried to maintain this front line on way less money than you actually need to run that properly. And so uh, basically have ended up with relatively hollow forces that they just can't afford to fly enough or exercise enough with, especially, you know, buy enough munitions mm. <laughs> to actually be usable. So either those nations are going to have to accept uh, or should, I would say, accept that they need a smaller force probably not frontline force in terms of combat aircraft, but they probably need to do less of other stuff, whether that's mobility or, or ISR or whatever. Or they need, in order to afford the munitions, the training, the tempo to actually have a credible, really, really usable um, frontline force in terms of what it's supposed to be able to do. Or they'll need a lot more money <laughs> um, if, if nations don't want to cut back on that other stuff. Or they need to say, just make a policy choice and say, our, our Air Force doesn't have the mass or the money. Therefore, we're not even going to try and invest in that stuff. We're not going to buy fast jets. Mm -hmm. You know, we might buy some really, you know, some fairly cheap ones to do quick reaction alert just to defend our own airspace. But we're not going to even pretend to invest in all that high end stuff. And instead, we're going to specialize in, I don't know, tanker provision or mobility or you know, whatever it happens to be, all of which are highly important. But at the moment, too many Air Forces are trying to pretend they can do too much. Um, with a very limited budget, and that means that you end up with this hollow force. And we probably find a lot of a lot of nations would have exactly the same issues the Russians have had when, if they were ever called upon to actually, you know, go do the high end stuff um, against a serious opponent like the Russians or the Chinese. The second lesson I think uh, we can take is that Fodlak may have been going on about integrated air defense systems as the, the the big problem that needs to be dealt with for a long time. The lesson from the Ukrainians to the Russians, in terms of what the Ukrainians have been able to achieve against the Russian air force is, to my mind at least, it doesn't even matter if you manage to break the integrated air defense, defense system, i.e. you manage to knock out the S-400s, the S-300s, the Pollyanna command vehicles that are stitching it all together, some of the ground control relay links, the, the command centers. Um, you know, In other words, you manage to get at the really big, long-range, scary threats and the radars that feed them and the command systems that, that and, and nodes that enable them to coordinate and make the, the whole thing more efficient in terms of coordinating the medium and short range stuff. But even if you do that, as the Ukrainians have shown, even if your opponent still just has medium and short range stuff that they're moving around, they're not even using it as, a, as an integrated defense system. They're just using it as a disaggregated pop-up air defense threat. That still stops you from using it, from gaining control of the air and doing anything usable with most of your fleet. Sure, stealth aircraft can probably work their way in and, and do stuff around the margins, but it's not, it's not, assured access and most of NATO air power is not stealth air, stealth combat aircraft. It's tankers, multi-role traditional fighters, UAVs, helicopters, like it's all this stuff that really isn't usable 
until you've dealt with that mobile medium range, particularly medium range uh, radar guided threat. And we're just not set up for that anymore. We don't have the number of munitions. We don't have the number of, of stealthy platforms or standoff munitions with a sufficiently low price point to have in quantity with sufficiently advanced seekers to, to reliably kill these things after their radars turn off. And most of all, we don't train aircrew for this at, at scale in European NATO, at least. There are a few specialized units still in the USAF. But um, yeah, th this is a huge problem. We, we really need to reevaluate how seriously we take CIAD BIAD um, uh, collectively within NATO, um, and particularly in European NATO, um, because without it, you just can't do control of the air. We've, we've concentrated for a long time on the air-to-air -air piece, um, you know, the, the offensive and defensive counter-air mission set. And to be fair, NATO air forces are generally fantastic at that, and based on the performance in Ukraine, would absolutely wipe the floor with the Russian air force in a sort of isolated fair fight in some magical area where the ground-based threat didn't exist. Mm -hmm. But that's just not how things are going to go. With the, what we can see now in terms of what the Russians haven't been able to do, we can gain those sort of lessons up front. But what we can't do yet is look in real detail at what the Russian Air Force has been doing, because the, just the granularity of data isn't there. If you work for a, a reasonably well-connected think tank, you might be able to talk to a lot of the military side of things who have different views, both Ukrainian and, and you know, the, the Western militaries who are running surveillance flights and are training and helping them um, to stitch together a bit more. But even for them, I mean, you know, if you think, for example, of what a, how far uh, an AWACS operating on the Romanian-Ukrainian border is from the Donbass, you know, they might have some over the horizon capabilities that might give them some idea of what's going on, mm -hmm. but it's not at any sort of granular detail level because they're operating way beyond direct radar line of sight. And so, yeah, it, we, we just don't have the granularity to really know what the true lessons are in terms of what the Russian Air Force has been doing as opposed to what it hasn't been doing. Right. And take, actually taking that point and, and sort of talking about sources and verification of information and what is actually available out there publicly for, for mere mortals to sort of tap into. Um, what would you actually encourage viewers to do at this moment if they're interested in, in this conflict? Where should they get their data from? What should they look at? And what is the sort of the verification process that you would recommend? So for the, the, the starting point I would suggest is in terms of OSINT uh, is just start with the Oryx blog in terms of losses on both sides. So you, you still see these absurd claims on both sides that, you know, the, the Ukrainians claiming they've shot down whatever it is, three or so, 170 Russian aircraft. It's absolute rubbish. It's complete fantasy. Um, and equally, the, Ukrainian, the, the Russians claim to have destroyed the Ukrainian air force about four times over. The Oryx blog is a good place to start because everything that they list is based on verified, visually ID'd losses. And so while it is probably not complete, it is broadly speaking accurate. And you can see pretty clear trends within those sort of data sets. So you know, the Russians have lost at least 10 Sukhoi 34s. That's significant. That tells you quite a lot. This is a high-end Strike Eagle type platform that has mostly been doing low level and has now been trying to do medium level standoff attacks in Donbass. The fact that they've lost 10 of them from a fleet of about 110 is quite significant. Those are serious losses especially given how conservatively they've been used. Um, equally, they've lost 17, I think it is now, Sukhoi 25s confirmed. Well, they only had about 85 modernized ones. So, and they're only using the SM, uh, the SMs and the SM3s, um, the, the modernized ones. So that's a really significant chunk of the fleet. Um, and equally, you can see trends within the helicopter losses, for example, that the Kamov 52s are far more vulnerable uh, than the, the MI-28s and the, the MI-24s, for instance. Otherwise, I highly, highly recommend, and I would, but uh, I highly recommend the uh, report that was released this week um, by my colleagues at Rusi, Jack Watling and Nick Reynolds. Um, so they've literally just come back from Ukraine uh, the week before, um, uh, having been out there for a couple of weeks. And they've, that's not the first trip they've done since the war uh, started. And their access is pretty crazy in terms of getting around the front lines and, and uh, you know, talking to the Ukrainian military and military intelligence up to the very, very most senior levels, as well as going around on the ground with the units. And so if you want to understand why things are happening the way they're happening and what is actually happening, uh, particularly on the, the ground side of things with UAVs and artillery and things uh, and electronic warfare, 
go read that report. It's um, it's the best you will find in open source. Uh, and, and I'm very happy to stand by that claim. Yeah, I will post the links as well in, yeah, the, in the comments, uh, not in the comments, like in the description for, for um, people to follow up on. Um, Justin, thank you very much for, for, uh, for your time and answering the questions. It's been a pleasure as always. And uh, yeah, thanks very much. My pleasure. So I hope that you enjoy that and now it's up to you. Use that comment section below, talk amongst yourself, provide some feedback, provide a discussion there as well on what you think some of the lessons might be that we are will be drawing out of this Ukraine conflict, whether that's with the air domain or generally speaking about well, perhaps foreign policy, security policy and all that stuff. And of course, if you enjoy this sort of content, well, first of all, big thank you to those people that make it possible with their support of the channel over on Patreon and via channel memberships. If you're interested in supporting this sort of content, well, first of all, you're also getting a couple of perks from it, from early access to these sort of videos, as well as we have a Discord server, as well as regular meetups there. Do check out those links in the description for Patreon and YouTube channel memberships. So now, of course, I wish all of you a great day. Surround yourself with friends and family. Go out there, have a good one, and see you in the sky.